So we'll now move to the our next speaker, Professor Eric Verlin. Professor Verlin, can you please uh, share your screen and then? I will, I will do so. Uh, can you hear me oh. also? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, let me see. I should probably go to the beginning. We can see. All right. Okay. So uh, welcome uh, everyone to the last lecture of today's uh, conference on aspects of emergent gravity. And let us welcome Professor Varlinde on behalf of IEGRG and the organizers. So Professor Varlinde is a well-known physicist on this area of emergent gravity and has been a proponent of the entropic force and various other conjectures related to the emergent nature of gravity. So it's a pleasure to hear from Professor Varlinde. So it's now up to you, Professor Varlinde, please go ahead. Thank you very much also for the invitation. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I've not been here uh, earlier, I um, mean, have a busy day, but I'm very pleased to talk about the um, work. I mean, it's actually old work that I've been doing on the aspects of emergent gravity. And certainly also I want to sort of connect to things that um, uh, Padmanabhan uh, has been doing. I mean, this is in a memory of, of him. I mean, I have to admit that I never sort of interacted with him very much, although professionally, of course, I've been influenced also by his work. Uh, so I will also mention some of the overlap that, that uh, I have uh, in, in the past uh, about thinking about these questions. So this is a conference about uh, emergent aspects of gravity, and certainly that was one of his main interests, but other things like dark energy and, and sort of the microscopic nature of space and time is kind of what is uh, currently sort of studied a lot. And actually one of the uh, things I want to be uh, emphasizing is that um, we have some understanding of emergent gravity in some space times, basically without dark energy, but that when there is a, sort of an interplay between the emergence of gravity and dark energy that we might actually see some other uh, phenomena appear, appearing. And, and certainly this was uh, kind of inspired also by, by ideas that he, he put forward. So actually I wanna do it a little bit in the historical context. I have to admit that in my uh, work, I have not uh, recently, uh, worked on the emergent gravity, mainly mostly involved in ideas of quantum chaos now. So I went back to old ideas uh, and, and uh, I will indeed put it in a more historical context to see uh, where these ideas are might, might eventually, ideas might eventually go to. I feel even that the original ideas that, that gravity might be emergent even goes back to the old uh, Penrose Hawking singularity theorems. I mean, there's some way in which those theorems and the way they were used and, and later developed eventually led to our insights that, that there might be some thermodynamic aspects also of gravity. So one of the key equations in this, this was this Ray Chowdhury's equation, which is sort of a focusing equation that tells you that when the matter satisfies certain inequalities, that we indeed uh, have a focusing and therefore also some singularities form when there is uh, our trapped surfaces. Now, uh, this also led to uh, theorems about black holes and then eventually led to uh, also the study of black hole horizons uh, as the natural way to think about um, thermodynamics or the connection with, with thermodynamics came about. And this uh, was already in the early 70s that people knew about these similarities between gravity and the thermodynamic equations. And you might say that this is already a very strong hint about emergence because somehow we know that thermodynamics, of course, is emergent. But it took quite a while before people start taking those steps. Um, I feel that now when we are looking at the black hole uh, entropy and also the, the, the thermodynamic laws that uh, they can be sort of uh, obeyed, is that we have indeed strong indications that, that we should think about the, the laws of thermodynamics as really being derived uh, then from a statistical uh, approach like they normally are. And that 
asked, then, then we led to the question, I mean, what are the, the basic ingredients that um, lead to these um, thermodynamic laws? And uh, indeed, what, what is the correct uh, microscopic theory to do so? Now, one of the early ideas uh, is going to the work is, um, well, uh, is basically that the, uh, there is some notion and some uh, interplay with um, the entanglement structure. I mean, uh, so when we think about the, ent uh, the entropy formula, what does it mean? It might actually mean something related to uh, entanglement entropy, an idea that had been put forward by many people. Um, I mean, uh, I think, uh, well, Paddy also uh, talked about this a lot, actually, and also, uh, as I will show in the next slide, it all sort of features in, in the earliest ideas about the emergence of gravity that, that Jacobson uh, put forward. One of the ingredients in all of this is indeed that you have to assume that the entanglement entropy obeys this area law in the sense that the entanglement entropy near horizons is given by the geometric area of a horizon. So this is a, a short, uh, quick review of, of uh, that uh, derivation of the Einstein's equation, which indeed uses, again, the same uh, Weichari's equations that uh, also led to the singularity theorems, and um, then just imposing the first law of thermodynamics by equating the change in the area with the change of the heat flow through a, a horizon surface, uh, he, he was able to show that one actually basically arrives at uh, the, the Einstein's equations uh, by, by just while well, following um, the, the, the standard uh, logic. And, and indeed, the, the assumption has to be that the uh, entropy, therefore, uh, is given by the area, uh, which I, I, I really have to emphasize is an assumption that, that uh, re is required to get to the Einstein's equations. So, uh, but, but Madaban also had uh, ideas about this, and actually this is a paper, I think around 2003, where he already um, um, indeed emphasized also the, the um, importance of, of entanglement across horizons. He also showed that, that then the gravitational action basically is a statistical, can be interpreted in a statistical fashion uh, as, as some uh, free energy. And also the, um, question of what, what would then be the underlying principle, uh, there was some way in which he expressed that there might be some uh, extremization of the number of degrees of freedom when you separate gravitational and matter degrees of freedom uh, together. These are ideas that nowadays are also still being discussed. Somehow this was already uh, there in his work. Uh, another thing that I want to... Uh, actually, I interacted with quite a bit, actually, with, with uh, his ideas, uh, was about the point that, that when we're thinking about, um, uh, well, emergence of gravity, we should not only think about emergence of, of the force or, or the Einstein's equations, but we should also think about the, um, well, what, what is the difference between a uh, free-falling and an accelerated observer, namely, what is the, the um, origin of, of something like inertia, because, I mean, we know that when we accelerate, we are, well, we have to uh, apply a force, and, and this actually is important when you think about gravity. I mean, because you cannot talk about emergence of gravity without also talking about emergence of space-time, and, and what is space-time? It's basically uh, a frame also that, that defines then what is an inertial frame. I mean, that comes from the space-time itself, and you have to understand that when you talk about the emergence of gravity, you also have to start with uh, what is the uh, origin of uh, inertia. So inertia and mass, of course, are closely related. Uh, and here I'm making these points again, that, that when we're discussing these issues about the emergence of space-time, then we start with inertia. And the fact that we usually only talk about the emergence of Einstein's equations in mind, mind actually misses an important point that, that uh, actually Einstein's equation is almost like a second order effect, namely the first order is basically uh, indeed what is uh, geodesic motion. I mean, how can we explain even why there is um, something like inertia to start from? And here there might be a very important difference between different space times. When you talk about uh, the sitter space, for instance, versus anti-de-sitter space, 
uh, there's a very essential difference is that that um, in anti de sitter space we have uh, something called uh, the well the boundary uh, in the sitter space it's it's much harder actually to to think about uh, inertial frames uh, i mean it comes back to sort of the the question of of the mach principle i mean what is the reference frame with respect to which we define um, are inertial frames in anti de sitter space the boundary plays in a very important role and it was actually the the original motivation for for einstein uh, i believe actually that uh, he wanted to introduce something like the cosmological constant or something like the sitter space to get rid of the um, um the boundary issue in the sense that that he wanted to go back to this this machine idea that um it's basically the matter or or actually the space time well, without the boundary that that defines the um, the inertial frame. Anyway, this is a point I'm going to go back to uh, to later in the seat. Indeed, about also what is the difference between anti de sitter space and the sitter space. So, in 2010, uh, I I did an idea about something about the emergence of uh, inertia. What is the origin of inertia? And the basic idea is that that uh, when we have a mass in this in the neighborhood of a, of what might be a horizon, then in order to keep it there, uh, you have to apply a force. And and the reason is that that the horizon has a temperature, and the only assumption that you have to make here is that when you um, displace the, the the mass a little bit, that there's a change in in entropy. And there's a way of actually defining the mass in terms of this change of entropy. Um, these arguments are very simple in the sense that when you write down the temperature, which being the Ungu temperature, then applying the, the, the rule of the, the term, well, what's called an entropic force or just a, a first law kind of equation, then you actually derive indeed the correct uh, value of the inertial force. Uh, provided indeed if you that you connect the, the the change in entropy to the origin of the mass well this uh, way of thinking about inertia actually uh, is closely connected to the way that that uh, Beckenstein even started thinking about uh, well his thought experiments about how to derive uh, even the Beckenstein Hawking formula uh, namely by doing these thought experiments by lowering boxes towards the horizon and indeed he derived also that when you have a, a, a box with a certain uh, size, that um, the amount of entropy that you have uh, inside that box is bounded basically by um, imposing that the entropy uh, increase of the black hole when you lower the box into the black holes cannot be um, smaller than the amount of uh, entropy that, that you actually lower into the box. Uh, lower into the black hole so that actually puts an upper bound on on the, on the amount of matter of, of entropy in, inside this box of size r which we can call the Beckenstein bound this bound has been been criticized a lot actually because it's basically uh, seems to say that there either is this upper bound there's something about the matter um, well the maximum entropy that matter can have and and things like the species problems were were sort of um, raised as, as counter arguments, but these ideas have been made much more precise in recent years, thanks to work by Cassini and others who uh, realized that these arguments uh, about entropy near horizons can be defined using uh, entanglement, laws from entanglement entropy. So this Beckenstein law that I, I put down here actually was reformulated by, by uh, Cassini in terms of what's called a first law of entanglement entropy. And uh, even the, the arguments that I gave for what is the origin of inertia can somehow be, be led back to this uh, the same uh, equation because it basically tells you indeed there's a relationship between what is called the model or Hamiltonian or the Hamiltonian, the boost Hamiltonian actually near the horizon and the change in entanglement entropy. So the way that appears is that you uh, define the density matrix and you write it by definition, basically in thermal form. And then whatever the operator that you uh, have in the exponent, uh, you call K is then called the model of Hamiltonian. And then uh, just from the definition of this operator in terms of the, the um, 
density matrix you can derive then that the change in entanglement entropy has to satisfy this first law. So this is a, a basic law that we can derive microscopically and indeed is then the law that should be uh, equivalent to a, a, a form of the Einstein equation, basically following similar logic as, as, uh, as Jacobson put forward. Um, now, I'm going to indeed discuss uh, various cases. Uh, anti deciduous space, of course, is very well studied, and there we have uh, a lot of um, indications of, of yeah, what the microscopic theory might be. And we have many ways of checking these ideas about the emergence of gravity. Um, so, anti deciduous space, as is clear in the picture, has a boundary, while the sitter space has this horizon. And, and indeed, there's lots of uh, differences between the two. And, and I will try to sort of focus a bit more on, on where we can maybe, well, use some ideas of ADS CFT, but then see how to generalize them to um, uh, the sitter space. So in, in anti deciduous space, we know, of course, we have emergent gravity in, in the usual way uh, by, by while well, having the microscopic theory on the boundary and then sort of space time indeed emerges in this uh, framework and sort of the ideas that 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 we can try to develop more generally about immersion space time can then be tested also in this, this uh, framework. And indeed, these uh, relationships between uh, the first law of entanglement entropy um, and and the Einstein's equations can then be worked out in quite detail and has been done in quite a be beautiful way by Faulkner et al. Uh, namely, they showed, in, uh, well, using very similar methods, basically, as J Jacobson, that when you impose uh, the first law of thermodynamics or the first law of entanglement entropy and identify the entanglement entropy with the area, and in ADS-CFT, this is sort of well established, um, then actually by assuming that the area indeed is equal to the uh, entropy, you can then um, derived that when you uh, impose the first law that you get the uh, linearized uh, Einstein's equations. And this was first done for the vacuum, but later uh, people generalized this also with, with matter fields uh, in the bulk. And so uh, at least in first order, we know that these equations uh, can be derived using these uh, entanglement uh, law, uh, laws of entanglement entropy. So this is already a very well established way of thinking about emergence of gravity. And I feel there's no, um, well, any other um, theory or other discussion of this should take these uh, ideas also into account or should be consistent at least with, with this. Uh, indeed, also here we have a much better idea of what the microscopic uh, picture might be because there is indeed a CFT that we know about and we have had more, more uh, handles to, to treat this in anti deciduous space, but we would like to generalize this to the uh, sitter space as well. And um, so the same idea, namely what we have done here is basically looked at a, a subregion of space, uh, which could be called a causal diamond. I mean, it's sort of where we separate the space by having a, a local uh, horizon. I mean, here in this case, it's actually a Windler horizon in anti deciduous space. And uh, there we know that these laws uh, hold. I mean, this is a very, uh, as I said, well established situation. But trying to generalize this to other space time, actually, it's, it's co convenient to think about uh, other causal diamonds that are not connected to the boundary. And so I'm going to write down the same equations again. Uh, basically in, in what is called a causal diamond. And these are, again, ideas that, uh, that Jacobson developed, well, shortly after, I think, the papers by Van Ramsdorf et al., that, um, that if you think about a causal diamond as the, the future and past uh, causal domains of a, a finite, say, ball-shaped region, then uh, you can, again, think about... Um, well, trying to derive the Einstein's equations from the first law of entanglement entropy, namely by indeed defining the quantum entanglement of the inside region with the outside. And then it's found that the Einstein's equations uh, are derived um, again by, by identifying the change in the area uh, with the change in the en energy. However, there's a, a small caveat here, namely that in doing this, one has to keep something constant, which is called the volume. 
and and that's actually a little surprising uh, but actually it will will be important for for the rest of my talk is that that indeed there's this equation that tells you that um in order to write the Einstein's equations then uh, we have to change a a well space time by adding some matter for instance we want to see what is the the, the linearized equations then something needs to be kept constant in order to define this change in area and it turns out to be the volume the same law can therefore be written and uh, let me see yeah in slightly different form but maybe before i go there indeed tell you what is this model hamiltonian uh, turns out that uh, the the model hamiltonian normally has the interpretation of a time evolution generator which is uh, well the boost uh, generator near the horizon but in these uh, ball shaped uh, uh, regions we uh, have to um, well look at something called the conformal killing vector uh, because it's not the, an actual killing vector uh, and uh, the form of the killing vector uh, is is written down below that that there's a a uh, radial dependence uh, of the well the killing vector itself actually goes to zero of course on the boundary of the, of the ball shaped region so a uh, little r here is the um, the size of the region and and x is then the coordinate inside and then you see that indeed at the boundary it goes to zero and this is a um, explicit expression then for for what would be the the the, uh, the model of hamiltonian this can actually be derived for conformal field theories generally but uh, it's believed to be sort of at least true uh, for other uh, systems as well and then indeed in that case you can derive these Einstein's equations um, now uh, already mentioned that that uh, derive the Einstein's equations we had to keep the volume constant when we change the area but there's a more general equation uh, which is also equivalent to the Einstein's equations if you allow the volume to change as well and then there are two terms on the right hand side so we have a, a sort of extended first law by having not just uh, the, the delta k being delta a so not just uh, change in energy gives you change in entropy there's also a um volume uh, correction uh, and so that's a lot more like sort of maybe a pressure term you might think but actually it's quite an important uh, aspect of this is that that when you apply these uh, ideas of um, emergence of gravity in in a a region where you well a causal domain where you don't have a boundary that you should also include this uh, volume uh, change and and i will uh, as i said con connect to this uh, later as well one of the uh, nice uh, things actually which uh, i'll be using later is namely that you can apply the same idea even to the a causal domain that is actually bounded by horizon namely if we take the static patch in the sitter space you can also write down a, a killing vector actually the conformal killing vector in this case is a killing vector and you can again think about the Einstein's equations by thinking about changes of the size of the horizon. In that case, uh, this change in the area of the horizon when you add matter actually again has, uh, has been worked out in many cases. Actually, there's a funny minus sign that you have to sort of watch out for is that uh, somehow uh, when you, it seems like the, the area decreases when you add uh, mass to the sitter space. Um, this is an important point that that also um, is emphasized a lot by by Ted Jacobson. He seems to suggest that there may be some negative temperature playing a role. I like to sort of think about it slightly differently, uh, namely when you take the mass inside a, a um, static patch and you throw it over the horizon, you basically let it again uh, disappear behind the horizon, then of course the horizon area will increase. And I will uh, regard that as the, the actual implementation of the first law of thermodynamics, where there would be a positive entropy change with a, a change of energy, but then the energy sort of behind the horizon. It's sort of then at least the laws look very similar to what we know from black holes. Now, the, the interesting comment is that, that uh, I mentioned that you can keep um, well, you can change the area by, by keeping the, the volume constant, but there's another way to think about uh, the change uh, that happens when you add matter, namely, in not, instead of changing the, the, the area, we can keep
keep actually the area fixed and then the volume needs to change. So the equations that I had on the previous slide, namely there's two ways of uh, writing the, the variation of the model Hamiltonian, either as a, you can compensate it by a change in the area and then you see that minus sign, but there's also another way of, um, well, um, compensating the change in, in uh, the model Hamiltonian, namely is, is keeping the area constant, but then changing the volume. So that's the equation that I have there at the bottom, uh, namely that tells you that, that there's some sort of volume change in the sitter space when we add matter. So this is actually uh, uh, an interesting thing to remember, uh, and I'll come back to that later. So uh, when we compare the sitter space to the anti sitter space already mentioned, there is a horizon. Uh, and one thing that, that I, I uh, want to now argue is that uh, the appearance of that horizon, of course, is directly related to uh, the presence of dark energy in, in our universe. And it also will be associated with a, a entropy and a temperature. Uh, and then the question is, is what is uh, responsible for the entropy and the temperature? And my uh, suggestion is that this should be the dark energy itself. And there's some way in which dark energy itself um, must be, well, first of all, it carries an, an energy. Uh, and this is why the name dark energy is kind of very nice. It, it sort of makes clear that it's not just maybe the cosmological constant, because that is kind of how it appears in Einstein's equations. When we think about an emergent uh, the sitter space, um, then somehow this dark energy is a true energy of the microscopic degrees of freedom. And also the entropy associated to the cosmological horizon will therefore also be an, an entropy uh, associated to, to the state that we are uh, considering. At least this is a proposal I'm making. It's sort of motivated by many things we know about black holes and, and, and anti sitter space and, and so on. So uh, at least when we, uh, well, before we have a, a full finite uh, microscopic theory of the sitter space, at least this is a, is a reasonable assumption that uh, somehow the entropy uh, is carried by microscopic degrees of freedom. And also that the energy that is sort of contained in the dark energy is also uh, living in those degrees of freedom. And then that also means that the temperature um, that we uh, associated with the cosmological horizon must be uh, carried by those microscopic degrees of freedom. Normally, we, we think about indeed black holes uh, as, as objects that have microstates uh, and indeed can carry a temperature and, and therefore the, the entropy also, uh, well, it's not only entanglement, but might actually also be counting actual microstates. And in the sitter space, we have, sorry, in string theory and also in entity sitter space, we have ways of representing those states, uh, those microscopic states. And one of the things that we learn from there is that, that the degrees of freedom that are responsible for the entropy of a black hole are not the same as the ordinary particles that, that are, are phases of, of, of the matter that we, we uh, know about. I mean, it's, it's really a... a, a Another type of um, excitations that play a role in string theory, they're, they're like what are called usually long strings or in, in ADS CFT, it's the, the deconfined degrees of freedom of the boundary uh, um, instead of a gauge theory or N equals four Young Mills, that sort of it, it needs to be um, used to, to the, explain the entire entropy. And, and also in other string theory models, uh, we generally talk about two branches of, of the, the theory. One, which we call usually the Coulomb, Coulomb branch, where we have individual particles that can move freely on space time. But then on this other sort of branch where we can account for black hole entropy, uh, the things are, are, are not uh, localized anymore. You have actually a, an entropic phase, which large, um, long range even uh, um, degrees of freedom. So it's a non-local state of the theory. So this actually, uh, I'm mentioning this because this is also the picture I'm gonna have for the sitter space, where I, I say that the entropy and the en energy that is contained in, in there should sort of be thought about in a similar way as we know about black hole uh, microstates. So then the question indeed, what is the entropy of our universe? If you would count everything that just inside there by photons, or, or even if you count just black holes, you never get to the number of the horizon area. So most of the entropy 
uh, in the universe, if you add indeed the horizon area of the cosmological uh, horizon, if we believe we live something close to the sitter space, you would actually get to an entropy that's even a little higher than the numbers written here. 10 to the 120 is kind of the number we can like, think about. But I, I indeed suggest that this is the actual entropy of the state, of the microstates that are uh, necessary to describe uh, the sitter space. So this is a different way, a uh, different kind of system or, or uh, microstate than what we have in anti sitter space. In anti sitter space, we generally think that the vacuum anti sitter space has a unique uh, ground state, and therefore there's no entropy, indeed there's no horizon. So this is a different context, uh, and therefore even the whole derivations that I talked about, namely uh, of Einstein's equations, has to be reconsidered in a theory where there might be many more, uh, well, sort of microscopic degrees of freedom that are slightly excited I mean, they have a temperature which is incredibly small because the, the, the temperature associated to the horizon is, is of course very small, but its uh, entropy is very large. And so uh, if those um, states would be there, sort of accounting for this entropy, it would be even very hard to detect because uh, these um, states would have uh, a very high degeneracy and even though, uh, while the energy is, is reasonably large, the, the temperature is incredibly small. That means time scales are very long. And so whatever dynamics is happening in those states might be not visible to a low energy observer. However, when we talk about gravity, these kind of things might uh, play a role when we talk at, le at least about long uh, distance effects. Indeed, when we think about general relativity, uh, general relativity has been tested in, in many ways. And of course, it's a beautiful theory and, and it's not something that you can easily uh, change. But uh, the tests are mostly uh, uh, in areas where the gravitational forces are strong. So this is a plot that I, I, um, I think I stole from... Um, uh, let me think. Um, anyway, uh, I'll think of the name. I think it's. Uh, but anyway, it's something that that I, uh, uh, when I saw this, was kind of very appropriate for the things that I want to talk about. Namely, it is a plot of where we sort of have uh, one. First of all, the, the gravitational curvature, which is like the tidal force, it goes like one of r cubed, and this one is uh, more like the potential. And there's uh, well, clearly, when when gravity is strong, we're in the upper region, and this is where. Um, most uh, tests have been performed. Uh, if you go to smaller uh, curvature or smaller values of the gravitational potential, this is where, uh, well, many things are, are uh, more confusing because there we have to either add dark matter to be able to still trust general relativity, and we are dealing with issues associated to dark energy. So the question is, well, is there a way even to connect these two regions and say that dark energy and dark matter may be, uh, well, phenomena that are related uh, to uh, the presence of this entropy that I, I talked about. And this is indeed what I I'm, uh, will suggest. This is a proposal that I want to uh, focus on in the last uh, slide, uh, part of the talk. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have this entropy. The total entropy can be uh, calculated this is given by the area of the horizon. And there's also the temperature set by the Hubble scale. And uh, the assumption now will be that, that the, these entropy and temperature are, are due to the positive energy, dark energy, but actually in a certain way are even carried by the dark energy. And uh, the other thing that I want to use again, which is something that um, uh, already, um, I, I mentioned uh, in the first part actually, is that when we add um, matter uh, inside a causal diamond, uh, then the area of the causal diamond actually becomes smaller. And this is even true for the horizon of the sitter space. Uh, you can even work this out very easily if you just write down the, the, the sitter Schwarzschild solution. Uh, there might be a two here actually missing now. But there's uh, at least a, a way in which uh, we can then determine the new location of the horizon, keeping the, the cosmological constant fixed. And then you find that, that the change in the area uh, is negative. Uh, and indeed, it's given by the mass 
um, divided or the energy basically divided by the temperature. I mean, this is just again the first law where the temperature is being used. Uh, and of course, a change in, in, in area, but uh, again, mind you, the minus sign uh, that, that tells you that there might be sort of like a, a, this negative temperature uh, law. Now, why did I show this equation? You have to look at the right hand side. So, what I pictured here on the right hand side, there's some way in which, uh, well, we have add matter, and you can think about uh, this matter as being a large galaxy. So, uh, let's m be the mass of that galaxy. Uh, then you see this quantity in here. And we also have a change in area. Now I'm going to tell you about a, an observational fact. And that's a, a fact that uh, if you look at galaxies, uh, well, already mentioned that, that there's a low gravity effect uh, associated to dark matter that actually uh, sets in at a certain characteristic and um, acceleration scale. So when we think about the acceleration, which is V squared over R, we see that there's a certain scale at which uh, the, the rotation curves flattens. And this is normally attributed to dark matter. But the thing that, that is kind of striking that indeed it happens below a certain critical acceleration that is related, at least seems to be related to the Hubble expansion, at least numerically. So this is an empirical fact. It's not something that, that a priori we could have guessed by, by a theoretical argument. Um, but the uh, surprising thing is, and actually yeah, sort of striking fact, is that if I write the, this ratio that I had also in my first law, namely the energy divided by the temperature, then the same equation is exactly telling you that the energy divided by the temperature must be smaller than the A of a 4G, where A is actually the, the area of a ball with a, a, a radius exactly equal to the, well, the, the, re the region I'm looking at. So this is the matter inside a certain ball-shaped region, and this would be the area of that ball-shaped region. And if this becomes less than this number, where indeed here we are keeping the temperature of the, the sitter horizon, uh, then actually we see this effect appearing. And so what I want to suggest in data that this effect might be actually uh, due to uh, the presence of this dark energy and the amount of entropy that it carries. So the next assumption uh, is then natural, uh, namely that I'm going to indeed uh, associate the entropy of the, the sitter space to the dark energy. And uh, I'm going to do it in the following way. Um, here I have written the, the entire uh, entropy of the universe. If we look at the universe sort of in one Hubble radius, then this would be the area of the horizon. And now I'm saying that this entropy is not just living on the horizon. It's actually associated to something that lives in the volume, in the bulk. So uh, I can basically compute the volume of this sphere with radius L and then divide this entropy by that volume and then I have an entropy density. If you then integrate that entropy density up to a certain radius R, you find that the entropy inside a ball of radius R would be, well, basically this formula. It's, it's very easy to guess because uh, this indeed grows like the volume, namely area times radius is, is going like the volume. And it's chosen in such a way that if I put R equal to L, uh, so the radius R is smaller than L generally, but if it's equal to L, then this number becomes equal to that number. So this is the, the volume dependence or the radial dependence of entropy inside a certain region. And this is not normally that how we can derive this from, from, from a, uh, well, horizon uh, entropy or something like that. This is an assumption. Uh, it's an hypothesis that the entropy that we associated to the cosmological horizon somehow can be distributed over the volume uh, according to this law. And um, then you see here this number, which is uh, smaller than the uh, horizon area, so or, or the area actually. So this would be the entropy then associated to dark energy inside a certain region of size r. Now I'm going to go back to this uh, empirical fact and tell you about uh, how to rewrite it. 
So um, this was the empirical law that we found that below this acceleration, we have a flattening of rotation curves. And the same law can now be rewritten uh, in the following form. So this is an entropy that uh, you actually saw before, namely it's the back end sign bound. The right hand side also represents an entropy, uh, namely it's the entropy that I had on the previous slide, namely the entropy associated to dark energy inside this region. So this formula is the same as what I have here on the right hand side. Actually, I put it in the, the constants with the speed of light in here. And so this left hand side I already mentioned is the Bekenstein bound. And somehow when the Bekenstein bound becomes smaller than the entropy which we would associate with dark energy, this is when this effect seems to be appearing. These are empirical facts. I have not done anything theoretical about trying to sort of well explain this, but of course uh, the ideas that I've been mentioning might actually uh, lead us to some, at least some way of trying to explain this. So what is the idea? I mean, the, I, I kind of uh, like to suggest that there's an entanglement happening. I mean, somehow inertia also had to do with entanglement and maybe the entanglement is not with the boundary uh, or something like that, or degrees of freedom living on the boundary. I'm claiming that matter in anti deciders or in the sitter space somehow starts also entangling what with this uh, entropy that's carried by dark energy. And so the amount of entanglement somehow must be related to the mass. I mean, that's kind of what we think already uh, we saw actually in, in this um, um, arguments about model Hamiltonian. Actually, there's some way that the matter mass and the amount of entanglement of the ma matter are related to each other. So then the question is, what is the entanglement with? And if we assume that there's entanglement between matter and dark energy, then somehow this effect, uh, when we see what we see happening, might actually be due to that entanglement. So here, here I'm saying this, indeed the left-hand side is entanglement entropy of the matter. <clears throat> the right-hand side would be then something that's uh, of entropy contained in the dark, <coughs> dark energy. So now I'm gonna <coughs> go back to the question of how do we derive uh, the gravitational force, or at least uh, yeah, things like inertia in, in a sitter setting. Here are some assumptions I'm making. Um, first of all, there's, uh, well, again, the connection with entanglement entropy. Um, if we wanna get GR, we already saw that there is uh, an, a requirement, namely uh, there should be an area law. And indeed, that, that also exclude any, any sort of thermal entropy contribution that is kind of uh, in, in the volume when, when the microscopic or, or gravitational degrees of freedom have a volume law, somehow this would change. So my point is that the sitter space is actually <coughs> such a state where we don't have a, a unique vacuum, but we have entropy also in the bulk. And therefore, the, the sitter space itself is not a, a ground state, but it's sort of a, a finite entropy state with a temperature and an energy density. And the dynamics is very slow. And, and then you can think about this uh, sort of as a glassy state. However, what I want to impose is that, that many of the principles that we put forward to derive gravitational laws can still be uh, applied. However, we now have to uh, include this volume contribution. And instead of changing areas, we're now also changing volumes. And this is why uh, I, I sort of suggested a, an analogy with elasticity, because that is actually about how things, uh, well, change. When, when volumes change, then generally we have a response that is uh, elastic. And this is what, why, um, well, the suggestion was made. And actually, there's another reason that I'll, I'll, I'll come to in a minute which has to do with trying to explain uh, the phenomenology that we have seen in, in, in galaxies and, and, and in clusters uh, that we now associate with dark matter. They seem to suggest some relationship that, that uh, somehow uh, have an, an, uh, a possible explanation from this elastic picture. So this is just to explain what a glass, uh, how different from, from any other uh, state of matter. I mean, uh, normally when we have a solid, we think about a crystal or something like that with a unique state, which is the lowest energy state. 
in a glass, uh, well, the molecules are not sort of perfectly aligned in some, some simple letters. I mean, they have many uh, configurations that contribute. And this indeed is then giving rise to very large entropy. Uh, although, uh, since the dynamics is very slow, and, and generally what happens in glasses, you don't see the movement actually happening. The properties of this material, uh, these two materials are very similar. Uh, and so the entropy density is there, but uh, it, it only uh, manifests itself in a very slow uh, dynamics. And also things are, that are called memory effects. Namely, any distortion of the, 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 the glass actually leads to certain strain uh, inside the system. And those strains can uh, stay there for a very long time. So if we take this picture also for the ground state of the sitter space, uh, with its dark energy, uh, indeed we get to some some nice uh, logical explanation of uh, well maybe the effects that we have been observing. The thing that I want to uh, get to in the last part of the, of the talk is namely uh, a relationship that also has been observed. Um, namely, I told you about the flattening of rotation curves, but there's actually a, a particular way that that appears. Um, normally, actually, the acceleration um, well, it goes like one over r squared if the matter would be localized. But um, well, if this v squared over r, then indeed the velocity would actually uh, go down to zero as well. But if um, somehow we have a different uh, contribution here due to dark matter that actually grows in a certain way, so that this contribution actually goes like one over r, then the velocities actually would become. Um, flat indeed like it's being observed and indeed that turns out to be sort of a relationship that if you take uh, the following to be true that if you take this baryonic acceleration that means just the observed matter uh, and um, you take basically the product uh, with of that acceleration with an acceleration constructed out of the Hubble constants and then take the square root then that is a relation uh, that if you put it in here actually leads to flat rotation curves and it's a relation that has been checked quite uh, well it's called the radial acceleration relation and here is a a plot from 2016 by these authors who collected a lot of data from from a a, a set of um, well galaxy rotation curves and they combined them into this uh, curve that is very well sort of described by this equation and what they call the radial acceleration relation. The interesting thing is that it can be extended. This is work done by Marco Brauer and, and her colleagues from the uh, KITS Kilo um, um, Array. I mean, this is uh, actually weak lensing observations of, of galaxies in foreground and background. And so they, they look at distortions of, of uh, these galaxies due to um, foreground galaxies. And then they can determine basically the gravitational potential of each of those uh, galaxies. And so they can extend it into regions where we don't have rotation curves. Um, so um, namely, this is only where light is there. So if you can observe the rotation curve, we know this part, but this is actually in regions uh, outside, further out, and the relationship still holds pretty well. There's some scatter. Uh, I think there's new data that even reduces the scatter somewhat, uh, but it indeed goes to very low acceleration. And so somehow this relationship seems to be a, a well-tested, uh, at least observationally. And I'm going to rewrite actually that relation a little bit, namely I'm going to take um, the observed uh, acceleration and I'm going to integrate it over a volume of, uh, of space. So I'm going to integrate it up to a certain region uh, size R. And uh, I put also one over four G in front of it. This thing can be thought about as the gravitational, the energy in the gravitational fields inside a certain region of size R. Then the relation, uh, the radial acceleration relation can be rewritten in a form uh, where I kind of put in H bars to, to make it a little more suggestive. Here we see something that looks like the temperature. There's however an additional factor of one sixth in here. 
And this is again the Bekenstein bound on, on entropy. So there's some entropy times temperature uh, relation on the right hand side. And the left hand side already mentioned is an energy. It's the amount of gravitational energy in here. So this relation uh, is another way of writing actually the um, radial acceleration relation. It also makes uh, manifest that, that indeed when this thing becomes smaller than the area, something starts to happen because this, this exactly describes this flattening of rotation curves. Again, this is observations. This is not yet theoretical. But now uh, the idea that I, I put forward uh, a couple of years ago is that maybe this, this same relation can be understood from this uh, idea that dark energy contains entropy and that the matter kind of entangles with it and that we can estimate the amount of entanglement by these formulas. Uh, first of all, the Bekenstein bound actually basically tells you how much entropy is then associated with the matter. So I'm going back actually to a slide that I had already in the first part that is uh, kind of the, the, the equation that uh, was obtained by Ted Jacobson for causal diamonds uh, in space time. But now I'm gonna uh, put it in here with um, uh, the situation where we put uh, causal diamond equal to the, the sitter horizon. Then I'm rewriting again this equation where the change in the area uh, of the cosmological horizon was given by the mass in terms of this, uh, well, formula here. But I already mentioned that there was another way of thinking about it, namely as a change in, in volume. And uh, here I'm thinking about the fact that the matter actually has reduced the amount of entanglement entropy and somehow have, has led to a change in the volume of this um, system that might be related actually then to the amount of entanglement that the matter has. Indeed, if you go to uh, an elastic picture in the following uh, way, that I'm going to now rewrite this entropy in the dark energy as an entropy density. I'm saying the amount of entropy that a matter actually sort of influences or takes away out of this uh, is a um, given by the Bekenstein formula, then you can estimate what is the amount of entropy that has been taken out, actually of a volume that's been taken out. Namely, I divide this entropy by the entropy density and that gives me a volume. And then I get this formula. And if you put actually uh, R equals to L, actually, I think um, you get the same formula that I have here. Because actually the um, Hubble constant is equal to one over L. So this is just by imposing this relationship. So what I'm saying, there's a change in volume due to the change in entropy. And that, that kind of thing you can think about as sort of as an elastic medium where I, I take something out and, and then you can try to see what is the response. And the thing that I noted the next is where even the ideas of elasticity came from is that indeed in, in a system, elastic system that is glassy kind of, uh, it's called the polymer melt. Uh, we have found relations that the energy inside a certain region can be rewritten in terms of the temperature and the amount of, well, in this case, polymers that have been taken out. But this actually I'm going to read now as the amount of entropy that this has been taken out. But there's a relationship that was known, uh, was derived by, by well, following ideas of, of the gen in these glassy systems. Uh, using what's called a, um, uh, what is it again? Um, I'm forgetting the name. There's some some uh, way that they use, um, well, it's like a snake getting out of this uh, this model. Um, so anyway, it's it's a known equation from elasticity. Actually, it's also be used in, in, in metal, uh, engineering. Anyway, it, it's a known equation that I'm, I, I can derive. And actually, one thing that I noted, that indeed, if we re replace uh, change in areas by change in volumes, that there's also a very natural way in which gravity equations become sort of identical to elastic equations. There's a correspondence you can make uh, between these quantities, which uh, are, first of all, gravitational, that's uh, acceleration or surface mass density quantities like this, and uh, 
what are elastic quantity like displacement, the strain or the stress. The interesting fact is that in order to identify these quantities, I need a scale and that scale is an acceleration scale. And when you put that in, actually the equations exactly match because I already told you there is a relationship between change in volume and, and strain. That's basically the relation I showed you. And that relay volume, change in volume already computed for you. And so when I put that together, I get indeed get uh, this radial acceleration relation. So I find that evidence at least for that, that these ideas might be uh, correct. Uh, I, I don't claim to have a, a full theory there, but at least I think ideas of emergent gravity in, in the sitter space is still an open problem. And I think the inclusion of dark energy is, is uh, crucial in there. Uh, there are many ideas that, that are working in anti sitter space, which cannot be sort of immediately transformed to the sitter space when we don't have a boundary. And one way to try and do this is, is to indeed uh, assign then entropy to the dark energy. And I think that might actually lead to uh, some surprises in the sense that uh, this area law that was required for the, the derivation of Einstein law might actually not be, be valid. And therefore, there might be uh, extra effects that we have not uh, taken into account yet when we just write down Einstein's equations. So this is, uh, again, uh, the conclusion. Actually, the conclusion is very similar to, to what I actually uh, wrote as assumptions, namely that uh, I think that gravity indeed can be understood now as, as emerging from something like entanglement entropy using uh, uh, a first law, and that when um, this entanglement entropy satisfies an area law in the sense that we impose that it's given by uh, the Bekenstein Hawking formula, then uh, we can derive Einstein's equations. Uh, but this indeed requires there is no other uh, contributions to the entanglement. And in particular, uh, we have not included something like a cosmological horizon. The other assumption I made, and I think uh, I hope to sort of also make that into a conclusion eventually uh, is namely that that we can think about the sitter space as an excited state where the entropy is finite and there might be a temperature and an energy density associated to that and therefore it has similarities with a with a glassy state and then uh, well the the principles of emergent gravity should still be applied and uh, i think then we should be open to the possibility that uh, the inclusion of this entropy to dark energy might actually lead to some extra effects um, similar to elasticity. And, and, and maybe that explains things that we have otherwise not been able to explain in terms of observations in dark uh, energy and dark matter. Anyway, I, I like to finish uh, there. Um, so this was my contribution to the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Varlinde, for such a nice presentation. Uh, it's now open to questions. So anyone who has a question, please unmute yourself and ask. Um, hi, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for that very nice talk, Professor. Uh, well, uh, my first question is that if we consider Lucifer to be uh, a glassy state. Uh, so you're essentially saying that it's a, a phase of some many body system. Uh, then one would think that this geometry would be uh, a point on some bigger phase diagram. Is that, uh, is my expectation correct? Or? Well, we already have, have different space times labeled by the cosmological constants. Uh, I mean, there's a, a, this, the anti sitter situation where I, I believe that the um, negative uh, and cosmological constants actually due to a, a, a sort of more a Casimir energy that is uh, there because of the, the finite size of the system. But there is no, um, entropy there. I mean, it's a unique ground state. So there's already a difference between a, a area law 
I mean, there we have an area law, let's say this way. I mean, we also know this in, in, in condensed matter, uh, there are certain condensed matter systems that, that do have uh, area law entanglement entropy, and there are other condensed matter systems that don't have this. So it's true that I think that uh, space-time may have different phases, and, and they are uh, characterized by the value of the cosmological constant. Okay. Uh, thanks. And um, I guess my, my second question would be that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Paddy also did a lot of work. Uh, he showed, uh, you know, in the first decade of the century that you can derive Einstein's equations from uh, some thermodynamic assumptions. So uh, how do you think uh, does that uh, fit in with your own work? Or do you think oh, I, I think I, I made clear that, that uh, the credit for deriving Einstein's equations go to many other people. I mean, I so, think uh, I think it's for me at least. I think that that Jacobson was probably the first to do this, and I see the work afterwards as maybe refining those arguments. And even what we have been doing in, in ads EFT is kind of uh, all related to that. I mean, eventually we know the equations that we want to derive. And one thing that I, I sometimes find in the literature, um, I mean, many of these people are actually relativists. And so they basically are reinterpreting the Einstein's equations, well, which is not exactly the same as deriving them. Because one of the things that you notice there is that, that you need to make assumptions in order to be der deriving it. So the, the arrow of the logic of how you derive them should be made very clear and and even the starting point for instance that normally what people do is they already assume the existence of a geometry before we even start well i find that that there is a question below that is that namely what is space time itself and so I, it's true that that buddy actually i think he he thought about those questions, but I don't think he ever um, uh, absorbed the, the um, uh, insights and ingredients that we have found to work in, 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 the, in, in string theory, for instance, or in ADS CFT, where we know much more about the microscopics. So anyway, I think, I think there, there are many contributions and certainly the inspiration and the belief that, that, that um, gravity was uh, emergent and had to do with thermodynamics was very much uh, part of his work. And I think I was certainly also strengthened in my belief that I should be following those, uh, those uh, directions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Deepak Wait. Uh, any other uh, questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, can I ask something? Shuman? Yes, yes. Uh, just a simple, I didn't understand. The uh, explanation of the rotation curves, the flattening of the rotation curves that you have given, does it require dark matter or it doesn't require dark matter? And that no. is a little confusing. I mean, at least, I mean, I, I would indeed argue that this is an effect um, associated to also the presence of dark energy. Okay. I mean, there might be some. Um, apparent dark matter in a certain way that it sort of behaves like a matter. I mean, in that sense, I think the effect that it's uh, a particle, for instance, is not necessary to explain anything uh, that we are observing. I mean, the connection with dark matter and and um, and gravity is is more indirect in the sense that we only see the effects on gravity. If there's some other way of deriving the same effects. Um, then somehow this sort of mimicking the presence of dark matter. So uh, I would, I mean, in that sense, I think dark matter is more like a placeholder for this phenomenon than that it's really an entity that we can associate with ordinary particles. So the name, I think, is suggesting already a solution. And I, I think that's a little uh, uh, premature. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shankar. Uh, any further questions from the audience?
Okay, if not, I would just like to make one comment in regard to the question asked by Professor Deepak Vaid. So, yeah, I mean, Paddy did not derive Einstein's equation from thermodynamics, but he went the other way around. That is, if you take Einstein's equations and project it onto the null hypersurface, you get the thermodynamic identity and you get something extra like the Navier Stokes equation. So, so I think. Who did this? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Who, who has done this? Uh, this is Paddy's work. So in oh, yeah, I understand. No, but I, I think he, he, of course, tried to go the other way as well. I mean, there's some way, but at least I think though that reasoning was never fully completed, I think. Okay, but anyway, I, I, think, I think his main motivation was to see that given the geometry of the universe, uh, there is an underlying thermodynamics. Rather That's than correct. to derive geometry from thermodynamics, just just a clarification. No, I I agree. I mean, so it's it's uh, I agree that 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 he he basically emphasized and and made more clear and and provided more evidence for the thermodynamic origin of these equations. That's what you're saying. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so, if there are uh, no further questions, let us thank. Uh, both Professor uh, Stefano Liberati and Professor Eric Berlinder, the two speakers of the afternoon session. And with this, uh, I wish to hand it over to Professor Shudipto Sarkar for some concluding remarks. So thank you all for organizing this nice and interesting seminar and thanks to IAGRG for their support. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ramanto. So first of all, on behalf of Indian Association for Gravitation and Cosmology, IIT Gandhinagar, IIT Madras, and Cultivation of Science, Kolkata. We like to thank all the speakers, Professor Ted Jacobson, Professor Mark Van Ramstong, Professor Eric Valinde, and Professor Stefano Liberati, who has kindly agreed to join this program. We wish if we could have done this program off offline sometime in some of our campus. Hopefully the offline programs will now start all over the world and the free flow of ideas will go beyond the laptop. So we are very happy that we as a students of PADI, uh, we could able to arrange such kind of programs and uh, we will continue to do several other programs related to several themes related to gravitational physics. On this mark, so I'd like to conclude today's program with thanking everybody, particularly the participants. Thanks a lot.